Hello, my name is Elvi. And I'm John. And today we're here at our school, George Washington Carver. We're going to be showing you a segment from our school broadcast, Carver Hub, about a man named Jack Trash, who's an author, a Waldorf teacher, and what else did he do? He also did a TED Talk. A TED Talk, that's pretty cool. My friend Jack Mossman is going to be interviewing him today. Stay tuned. is an educator with over 30 years of classroom experience, completing four eight-year cycles at Washington Waldorf School, and a teacher of teachers. He has written extensively on the issues of pertaining to innovative classroom instruction. His parenting pieces have appeared in the Washington Post on National Public Radio, and he is also the author of Covering Home, Lessons on the Art of Fathering from the Game of Baseball, which has received national, the National Parenting Publications Gold Award. You are the author of several books, including Understanding of Waldorf Education, T Teaching from the Inside Out. Can you explain to a teenager what Waldorf education is? That's such a good question, Jack. Um, you know, my experience in Waldorf education is just a little bit different than what it would be here at, at Carver, because I taught in a school from kindergarten through grade 12, and I work with students from first grade to eighth grade, so younger. But what I always thought was that, well, here's what happened. We had a, a policy at our school where in eighth grade, you could come dress for Halloween. And you could wear anything you wanted in eighth grade, because you studied the entire curriculum of the world through history. And one of the girls in my class came in that day with a little basket and a rabbit in the basket. And in front of the basket, it said Toto. And she had on her ruby red Doc Martens and all of a sudden I thought, oh, I get it. Being a Waldorf teacher is like going to Oz in The Wizard of Oz, right? You start out in first grade and you've got these little munchkins with you, right? And they'll follow you anywhere. And it's like, follow the yellow brick road. And then they treat you as the first grade teacher like you are the all-knowing, all-powerful Oz. <laughs> Right? And so if, if the kid comes in, a child will come in and say, you know, I'm out at recess, and I left that stick against a tree yesterday, and I was going to play with it today, but Billy took my stick. And they come to you to complain, and then as the first grade teacher, you say, well, I'm going to look at my watch, and for 10 minutes, Billy can have the stick, and then, Billy, you're going to give it to Matthew. And they just go away as if you've solved their problem. You're the all-knowing Oz. <laughs> and it stays that way for a couple of years. And then you get to that place in The Wizard of Oz where the grumpy trees are. That's around fourth grade where the, you take an apple off the tree and the tree slaps you and says, how would you like it if someone did that to you? And then in sixth grade, the evil monkeys come. And that's when all the backbiting and the gossip comes into the classroom and there are little cliques. And then in our school, in seventh grade, it was the poppies come. My seventh graders could yawn more in the presence of my lesson than I ever thought was possible. And I would always say, please pick your head up. They put their head on the t desk. And the only thing that got my students to wake up was snow. The thought that maybe tomorrow's school will be closed. That aroused them. They would wake up. And then in eighth grade, you get to Oz, right? And all of a sudden, they realize that you don't know a whole lot as the teacher. You're just this man behind the curtain pulling these levers. And they say, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. And truthfully, my eighth grade students paid very little attention <laughs> to what I had to say. But they paid attention to each other. And what I always would want the students to know is that if you came to the Waldorf School, it's like being in Oz. So if you were the scarecrow and you came looking for a brain, you got one at the Waldorf School. Every science experiment that you had to write down exactly what you observed. Every composition in history where you had to explain yourself from two different points of view. Or every uh, algebra word problem where you had to come up with the equation. That all developed your thinking. So if you were the scarecrow, you, you get a brain in the Waldorf School. But if you're the tin man, you also get a heart. So every watercolor painting that you do where the paints don't quite go, the colors don't go where you want them. Every time you learn a poem by heart or a story makes you laugh or cry, all of those things developed 
a deep re reservoir of feeling. And if, like the cowardly lion, you came for courage, all the things you did with your hands developed a capacity of will, you know, the strength to get up and do what needs to be done. That's what we need for tomorrow. And that will comes from every composition you had to rewrite and edit, or every math problem you had to do over because you got the wrong answer, or every drawing where you had to col color the whole page, every woodwork project that you finished, or uh, every games class where you had to do the extra exercise or the extra run, they all develop a reservoir of strength that we need. So that three-dimensional approach, that's what your Waldorf School is about. But it's also about a learning community. Right? Dorothy gets to Oz because she travels with the Scarecrow and the Tin Man and the Cowardly Lion, and together we're able to accomplish much more than alone. And that you also have that in a Waldorf school. You've got a learning community. So it's like going to Oz. That's my take on it. Beautiful, beautifully said, Mr. Petrash. And the name of your book is Teaching from the Inside Out. What would you say you mean by saying that? Uh, well, for me, a, an example of things that you learn from the inside um, that comes through poetry. Now, when I was in grade school, and please keep in mind, I, di I didn't go to a Waldorf school. I'm not sure it would be different if I had, but I was not the best student. And um, I had a fifth grade teacher who made us recite a poem called Abu Ben Adam. It's by a decent poet. He was a friend of John Keats and, uh, and Percy Bysshe Shelley, and he was a good writer. And, but boy, was it torture for me to stay up, stand up and learn this poem. But the truth is, I still remember it. And it's really a great poem. Uh, it begins, Abu Ben Adam, may his tribe increase, awoke one night from a deep dream of peace, and saw within the stillness of his room, making it rich like a lily in bloom, an angel writing in the book of gold. Exceeding peace had made Ben Adam bold, and to the vision in the room he said, What writest thou? And the angel raised his head, and with a look of all sweet accord, he answered, The names of those who love the Lord. And is mine one, said Abu? Nay, not so, the angel said. Then I pray thee then, write me as one who loved his fellow men. And then the poem goes on to say, The next night, the angel returned, and when he showed him the names of those whose the love of the Lord had blessed, lo, Ben Adam's name led all the rest. So this thought that's buried in that poem, which is that when you love your fellow man, you're doing the best you can, that was hidden in that poem. I didn't know I was taking that lesson in. I didn't even know that I would know that poem my whole life when I learned it in fifth grade. And so you see it goes inside you like a seed. And then it takes root and it comes up in surprising ways. Teachers teach like that, good teachers do. They give you things for life and there are good teachers in all schools. I, I went to the New York City public schools and in high school we had geometry and our geometry class was at 2.20 in the afternoon in the spring semester. And I thought, it can't be easy to teach 16-year-olds at 2 o'clock in the spring, right? Because our minds are on all sorts of other things than geometry. And one day, the teacher said to us, he said, you know, I have to tell you a story that you're going to need for the regents. That's the state test in New York you have to pass. And he said, I want you to know the story of this Indian princess, Sokotoa. She was in love with a brave from another tribe, and her parents would not let them marry. And so, in her sadness, she and the brave ran away from their villages. And he told us this story, and then he said, I want you always to remember Sokotoa. And he wrote her name on the board. It was S-O-H-C-A-H-T-O-A. And he said, remember that because the sign is the opposite over the hypotenuse. 
and the cosine is the adjacent over the hypotenuse, and the tangent is the opposite over the adjacent. You see, that's teaching from the inside out. You get that story, it goes into your heart, you mem remember it, and then the lesson comes. Uh, that's quite a wonderful story that you just told. He's a great teacher. <laughs> On, uh, when you were talking about the, the story of the Wizard of Oz, you talked about uh, during the lion, uh, the colors of the art. You talked about a lot about the art when you were talking about the straw man yeah. and the lion. Uh, why would you say art is so important in Waldorf education? Well... That's oh, another good question. It's not just art, it's art and music, right? It's the arts that are important. And because they speak to your, to your heart, they speak to another way of knowing. Waldorf School wants you to understand the world in two ways, both cognitively and effectively. You want to know it through your thinking, but also through your intuition. There are so many important things that we know in this other way. And training that capacity, developing that capacity, that can be done through, through art. Um, in Washington, D.C., where I taught and where, close to where we live, there's a very prestigious prep school. It's called St. Albans. It's a boy, boys' school. It's on the grounds of the National Cathedral. There's a girls' school there also. And presidents and senators send their children to those schools. Well, a few years ago, the boys' school, St. Albans, invited a, a writer, Thomas Friedman. He's a well-known journalist for the New York Times and the author of a book called The World is Flat and The Lexus and the Olive Tree. And they invited him to speak to the students because he's an authority on the global economy. And one of the students said to him, he said, um, Mr. Friedman, what do I have to do to be prepared for the job market of tomorrow. And his answer was really interesting. He said, your education's been a very good education, but it's only used half of your brain, the left side. And if you don't start using the right side of your brain, someone in a developing country is going to do what you're trained to do more cheaply. And if you don't start using the right side of your brain as well as the left side, a computer is going to do what you're trained to do more quickly. So if you want to be part of the future, he said, think art, think green, think connectedness. And that's because this other side of our brain, our whole human intelligence, really thrives on capacities like art and storytelling and playfulness and empathy, they're all qualities that are more uh, affective, they have more to do with our feeling life. And we need those for tomorrow, because if we learn out of balance, if we learn thinking without this affective side, it makes us pale, it makes us less imaginative, and that makes us less able to adapt to a rapidly changing world. I think that was absolutely beautifully said. And as a teacher, you've been teaching for a very long time. And what would you say is your favorite part about teaching? <laughs> I love being with kids. And I don't spend a lot of time with high school students, but I love when I get to spend time with the students in the grade school where I taught. I love that kids live in a magical world. A world where if two people say the same word at the same moment, you've got to say something else or else there's a jinx, right? I love that. And, and I love that they make up rules in a game that just aren't part of the rules that are standardly part of, of what goes on. I love the friendships that develop in a class because what I know is that during school, you become close to your friends in a way that just doesn't happen as easily later in life. You know, the children open their hearts to their friends. I always think that the friends I had in elementary school, I, I cared more about them than many of the people I met, let, met later. And uh, because young children just do that. And to be in their world keeps you young and alive and imaginative. 
there, it, that's one of the things I love about teaching. That was very beautifully said. Uh, you said that, that a lot of the th these things have only come up when you're teaching children, but you you also teach parents and other teachers. Yes. What would you say the differences are between those? Yeah. Well, children are easier. Um, you can invite adults into the world that children inhabit. You do it through telling stories. You sometimes can invite them in a way in which they become young again. When you do that, teaching adults is just as enjoyable as teaching students. This is a little bit aside from the conversation of, of schooling, but I work a lot with dads. And, and I've done that for a number of years. And one of my favorite questions to ask fathers is, what's the best memory you have? Just one really good memory of your own father. Now, not all people can say that, so I'll just say, well, tell me a really good memory that you have from a man who played an important role in your growing up if you didn't know your dad. But the stories that come take these men back. So here's one I heard. I heard a father say, I didn't know my own dad, but my grandfather took care of us after school. And every day we would come home and we would go up the stairs to our grandfather's apartment. We'd live downstairs, he lived upstairs. And he would make us a snack. And my grandfather would make Wonder Bread, he would toast it with Skippy peanut butter. Now that's not the healthiest food to, to, to serve a child, right? But he said, my grandfather would put the peanut butter on with the back of a spoon. And then the man started to cry because the memory of that movement was so embedded in him because he had seen it so many times that it really brought him back to being five years old. And that was really touching. And you hear those stories again and again where you get the feeling that yes, you're listening to a grown-up, but they're speaking as a eight-year-old or a 12-year-old or a five-year-old. And so when you can bring adults back to that world, there's something pure in what comes out of their response. So that's the challenge when you work with adults and with teachers, is just to break down the barrier, you know, where, because we all put up walls, right? And we guard ourselves. But if we take that wall down, we get real human contact. And you need that. Children just give it to you more readily. Not high school students, right? But the grade school, the first graders, the second graders, they just look at you with their eyes open oh. and their mouths open and they take it all in. What would you say is your most challenging day that you've ever taught someone, whether it was a child, a parent, or another teacher? No, well, that's a good question as well. You know, the challenging days for me have been the days when the way I was with the students was not what I hoped it would be. You know, the days of my impatience or my doggedness to get something done. You know, because afterwards you reflect and you just don't feel right about it. And so those days are hard. But the hardest days are the ones when things just don't go the way you expect. So for instance, at the school where I taught, the eighth graders made pizza once a week. It was a fundraising activity for us. And we ordered the pizza shells, we made the sauce, we put the toppings on, we'd put them in the ovens, and we would bake them, and then the students would buy them, and that was how we did it. But one day, it snowed the day before pizza day. And what that meant was that the pizza shells were not delivered because the school was closed. And as I got ready to leave for school at about seven o'clock in the morning, I realized there was no way we were gonna make pizza without those shells. And so instead of driving to school, I had to drive 15 miles in another direction to the warehouse where those pizza shells were stored before they were delivered, then drive all the way back in traffic, get to school 30 minutes late, and then teach. By the time I got to school, 
I was done. Oh, I'll give you another story. I taught first grade, and first grade's hard to teach. And I wanted to do a good job, and I was teaching the children at about 12 o'clock, maybe 11.45, and I wanted to make sure that I didn't treat a lesson as if it wasn't important. So I was teaching them how to draw at this time. And as I was teaching, one of the little girls in my class started to cry. And I see her crying, so I go over and I said, what's the matter, Claire? And she says, I don't like my picture. And I say, but your picture looks really nice. Oh, I don't like my picture. And, she, and so I kneel down next to her and I try to help her with the picture. And just then, one of the first grade boys says, out loud, I lost my tooth. And the whole class stood up. And they all walked over to his desk. And he showed them where the tooth came out. But of course, there's blood where your tooth comes out. And they all went, ooh. And, and then I got up, and I went over there. And I'm thinking, my class is just coming apart at the seams. And I said, look, Matthew, would you take Jeffrey to the office and show Mrs. Panuk, and she was our secretary slash administrative person, that Jeffrey lost this, that uh, he lost his tooth. And so Matthew takes him, he comes back and about three minutes later, and he's got a little gold treasure chest, which every child in our school gets when you lose a tooth, a plastic one. And the moment that everyone saw that, they all started wiggling any tooth that was loose. And I'm trying to get this lesson going, and all of a sudden, another boy says, I lost my tooth. And it was like the whole scene repeated itself. They stood up. They walked over. They saw the blood. They went, ooh. And by the time I got home, I walked in the house. And my wife said, what happened to you? I was a wreck. I was completely gone. So that was the hardest day. It was a sweet hard day, but it was hard. Uh -oh. What would you say was your hardest time par parenting a, a teacher or another parent? Working with parents and teachers. Uh, well, some of those memories of difficult times working with another parent or a teacher, I, I try to repress. Um, because human difficulties you know, are, are challenging. Everybody has a picture of what another person should do and, um, and coming to a cooperative understanding that you both can agree on, that takes time. So what I remember is that sometimes it takes, it takes years for people to um, come to an accord. I had a girl in my last class, a wonderful girl, incredibly feisty, and she was challenging in class. Uh, pretty much she did what she wanted. Um, always. And I remember mentioning that to our parents in first grade, and they just didn't want to hear anything about it. But in seventh grade, they came to me and they said, you know, we had a birthday party for Lily, and we saw what you've been talking about for seven years. Because she got really excited and she just wanted things her way. And so the parents could see, but it took longer than I hoped for us to reach an accord. Um, you have to be really always positive with children and work to seeing that we're talking about the same child. And that takes, that takes time because a teacher will describe what they see and a parent sees the child in a different way, always with love. I remember a parent in my class and I was talking to her and I said, you know, Ms. Patton, I don't know what I'm going to do with your son, John. I give him a homework assignment, he turns it in late. We're in class, he's always talking when I'm trying to teach. And if I say something to him, he argues with me. She says, I know, I know he's difficult, but isn't he a sweet boy? And I thought, that's exactly a parent's love. A parent will not relinquish the sense of what a child's best is, and a teacher can't either. I always thought that is a reminder to me I have to always look for the child's best because she sees that, and I should too. You have mentored teachers around the country, Waldorf teachers around the countries. K 
Can you tell us what you see that's different between public Waldorf schools and private Waldorf schools? Yeah, well, uh, yes, but let me start with what's the same. Um, when I talk to teachers in the charter schools or the public Waldorf schools, I find that their coming to the school has the same element of magic. You know, people will say, I came to the school, I was coming because I heard it might be a good place to work, and the moment I walked in the door, I knew this was where I wanted to teach. Or I didn't know about the Waldorf School, but a friend of mine took me aside and said, you know, I know what you want to do in the classroom and you're not able to do it. You should look at the Waldorf School. You'll be happy to teach there. So there's an element of destiny that is the same, whether it's a public Waldorf or the private Waldorf. And the, the parent communities, they seem the same to me. When I speak at a public Waldorf community, I remember speaking at the school in Arizona, and I thought, these are the same kind of parents I am used to working with. And it was the same thing when I was with a parent community in Salt Lake City at the new charter school they have there, or in Pennsylvania. The parents really care the same way in both schools. And the children, you know, children are the same everywhere. And, and I always believe that children know when they're being taught well. They just know. And these children look happy, and they do the things that, that children like to do, which is get close to teachers and stay after school and do projects. And I saw boys standing in the woodwork room at 3.15. He didn't want to go home. Came up to the woodwork teacher, and he said, do you have any more of those stools I can put together? Yeah. He was a sixth grade boy. He just wanted to stay and help. Those things are similar. The difference I see is that the public Waldorf schools are newer. And because they're newer, they're in the process of developing their school culture. And that takes time. The kind of events that you have here where you have Michaelmas and the third graders come from A.B. Wynn and Alice Burney to be part of that. Those are the cultural events that develop over time. The school culture, the traditions you have around the certain holidays and around the end of the school year, those come as schools grow into the work of educating children. And that, that's what I see in the public and the charter schools, that they're growing in to creating their culture. And it's a different culture um, in the sense that it's more innovative because um, you have different requirements because of the, uh, the state of California, but you also have different opportunities like this. Uh, you are retired from teaching now. Uh, what it, has, was it difficult for you to retire, and what have you been doing since you've retired? It wasn't so difficult to retire in the sense that when you take a class from first grade to eighth grade and you think of going back, you're thinking about another long-term commitment. And I knew at my age that it got harder and harder for me to keep up with my students. Taking them camping became more challenging. I became less uh, accepting of students who don't go to sleep when you're on a camping trip, just because I needed to sleep. And, um, and keeping pace with them, if you want to take them on a long hike, that got to be harder. And, and so I thought the time was really right for me to think about stopping. A woman who was my assistant, who taught with me, wanted to take the first grade. And I thought, that's perfect. If I step back, she can do that. And then I thought there were things that I really wanted to do outside of Waldorf, like visit other schools and see what the public school movement is doing and to make uh, a connection with the teachers and the administrators at those schools because I think that the public Waldorf movement is very important to the future of Waldorf education. All right. And as you are a father, and uh, I was just curious if you would have any advice for all of uh, the graduating class of Carver right now going into the world or any of the lower classmen. Oh. You know, it's hard to give advice, um, especially because I have no idea what the world is going to be like. The, 
world that you're going to inherit, the challenges that you're going to face. There was little that I could say that would assist you in meeting those challenges. But I guess when I think of my own children, I know that they've been, giving a re been given a reservoir of strength. Um, abilities that you can count on. The artistic abilities that are developed in a Waldorf school, you shouldn't forget them because they serve you. And if you play an instrument, you don't want to stop playing that instrument. If you sing, you want to find opportunities to sing. If you draw, you want to make sure that doesn't fade away. If you write, you want to keep writing. Creative things should always be part of your life. It gets harder when you're parenting and you have children, but it's still important. And you want to always look for what you love to do. That's the thing. Find what you love to do. Follow that. And go for it. Take that chance. Thank, well, thank you for being on Carver Hub with us. And I would just like to thank you for being here. Thank you, Jack. Well, you know, the story that I told you about Thomas Friedman, where he t said that you have to think art, think green, think connectedness. He'd read a book by a man named Daniel Pink called The Whole New Mind. And Daniel Pink really wanted to look at why we were outsourcing millions of dollars in jobs to countries like India and China and the Philippines. And he came up with six capacities that he felt young people need. Art, storytelling, play, empathy, finding meaning, seeing the whole, good qualities. They're all part of Waldorf education. What it made me think was that our education has been designed to use both sides of your brain. And there are certain subjects that do that more, more directly. And they're usually the subjects that are a little bit unusual in a Waldorf school, like eurythmy, right? So when you do eurythmy, you've got to be very conscious of where your hands go, where your feet go. So you're using the cognitive aspect of your brain, and yet you're moving to music and poetry. So you're using the affective part of your brain as well. And whenever we use both sides of our brain, that's an indication of higher order thinking. Neuroscientists say that whenever electrical impulses move from one hemisphere of the brain to the other, that's what's happening. It's, that's what happens when you play violin, string instrument. You've got this beautiful music. Uh, accessing the emotional side of your brain, and yet you're reading all that notation, which is using the other side of your brain. Same thing happens with geometric drawing. You get this precision of construction, but you get those beautiful colors. And the same thing happens in form drawing, where you have these curves, and yet they have to intersect in a way that you have to be conscious of. And so whenever we use the full, our full human intelligence, we're doing we're doing right by our potential. And truthfully, I think that's what a Walter School's about. It's a whole brain experience. I had a friend who became a Waldorf teacher before me. And he would always invite me out to the school. Well, what I should say is, I was a college student. And this friend of mine said to me, you should take this class. It's Ed 1. You can take it as an elective. It's four credits, and the teacher's an easy marker. You're going to love it. <laughs> right? So I had to go get an overtally, because the class was very popular. And I went there. And this man who taught the class, he just blew me away. He was one of those teachers where you just want to listen to every word. One of the things he did was he took us on a trip to the Waldorf School. It's because in ed classes, you visit different schools. And we visited the Waldorf School. And he gave us some reading on Waldorf education. And that was what brought me to think about being a Waldorf teacher. But what convinced me was a fair where I saw the high school seniors work. And there was a table set out. And the table I remember seeing, it was a young man uh, senior, and he had a globe of the earth that he had made. 
and he had a shirt that he had sewn in a handwork class, a flannel shirt that he had made. And he had his main lesson books with pictures of comparative anatomy from uh, comparative zoology. So sketches of the skeletons of horses and lions. And I thought, he's 18 years old, he's a high school senior, and he can do so much more than I can. I'm 23, I've got my master's in education, and he's way ahead of me. I thought that's the kind of education we want, one that develops people in, in this way. I was always surprised that they paid me to do it. You get paid to draw on the blackboard. You get paid to tell stories to children. And you get paid to take them outside twice a day. I, I thought that was incredible. But what you also get is an education. So if, like me, I went to public school, I didn't really have a thorough education because subjects like history, you know, we did a lot of math. I was very good at math, and I was decent in science. But I didn't know much about literature or about history or about geography. And as a teacher, I had to learn them. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes I would have a dream. And the dream was, it was a recurring dream, that I t showed up for a test that I didn't know I was going to have. <laughs> and the last time I had this dream, I was in college and I, I came into this classroom and everybody was busy talking the way people are before a test. And, and I asked them, what are you all talking about? They said, oh, we're talking about the test. I said, oh, the test's tomorrow. And they looked at me like, no, the test today. Now, I told you I wasn't a great student. That's the kind of detail I miss sometimes. And, and so in my dream, we sit down and uh, the teacher gives out the blue books that you write in in a college test, and, uh, and then gives out the questionnaire. And the questions on the test were, describe the architectural influences in a Gothic cathedral. And I thought, oh, I know that. I had taught that in sixth grade. I thought, I, I know that. And then it said, compare and contrast Sparta and Athens. And I thought, oh, I can do that. And I never had that dream again. I think what I realized was, this longing for education or this feeling of inadequacy regarding education, that had been um, taken care of by my having to teach. Because when you go from first grade to eighth grade, you get an education in so many ways. So I love that about teaching. And I loved that you could decide what you were going to teach the next day. So if a student asked a question and it just kind of stayed with you, you could come back and make that your lesson. I didn't have a textbook that said, OK, it's April 27th, and you need to teach this today. I love that I had that freedom. And then as a teacher, especially as the kids get older, you just value the conversations that occur between students. If you said to me, what was best about your eighth grade year when my last class graduated, I would say the conversation that we had about the bombing of Hiroshima. That was just the best conversation, just because of what the students said. Things that come up in class, that's just of incredible value. You feel privileged to do that. Yeah. Thank you for being with us. Oh, thank you very much, and thank you for your question. I'm Elvie. And I'm John once again. Hope you enjoyed the interview. Thanks for watching Carver Hub.